In my previous video, I discussed the various types of stars and organized them into four categories. Early stage stars, main sequence stars, late stage stars, and stellar remnants. This video will focus entirely on the creation of main sequence stars. However, if you are wanting to create an early stage or late stage star, then this video will still be useful to you, as it's actually easier to start with a main sequence star and then roll the clock back to make it an early stage star or roll it forward to create a late stage star than it is to create one of these objects from scratch. I will have videos explaining those techniques coming soon, so stay tuned. But if instead you're wanting to build a stellar remnant, then this video won't be very useful but I will likewise make a video about creating stellar remnants at some point in the future. Before we begin, we need to get our SAP sheet set up and ready to record our star's speculative astronomical parameters. This can be a simple sheet of paper, but it's often easier to record and edit the data on a computer. I'm using a simple text document prepared with all of the parameters that I'm going to be defining for my star. If you would like to use the same template I'm using, I have transcribed it in the video description below. Now, depending on the specifics of your fiction, you may or may not have a number of options for the creation of your star. If your planetary system lies astronomically close to Earth, say within 20 light years, then you should pick an actual star from the list of nearby stars and use all of its measured parameters. However, don't make the mistake of choosing a star based on the notoriety of its name. There are numerous science fiction authors who choose stars such as Procyon and Arcturus because they sound cool and are well known to audiences, but are in reality terrible choices for the human habitable Earth-like planets that the authors invariably place around them. You should instead use the information that we discussed in the previous video to choose the right type of star for your planet and then try to find a star that closely matches that on the list of nearby stars. I have included links to articles and websites with lists of the nearest stars to Earth in the video description, so hopefully those will help you find what you're looking for. If your star needs to be close to Earth, then you're going to have to take what you can get. But once you choose a star, you're going to have a lot of accurate and readily available data for it. Conversely though, the farther away from Earth you go, the harder it's going to be to locate data on the type of star you want. But at these greater distances, you can be a bit more creative and make your own custom stars. You can get away with this because the farther away from Earth you get, the more stars there are at that distance, and the greater the plausibility of a star like yours existing at that distance. There are two methods that we can use to create a custom star. The first, and my favorite, is that we can build one. This is what the majority of this video and subsequent videos will discuss. This method has the benefit of giving you total control over the star's properties, which allows you to tailor it to fit the type of planetary system you want to put around it. Plus, in my opinion, building stars is just more fun. However, this method is also the most complicated and time-consuming, which is why I need so many videos to teach you how to do it properly. The second method is cloning a star. Cloning a star involves simply taking an actual star of the type you want for your planetary system and copying its parameters to create a custom star. The benefit to this method is that it's quick and easy and because it's based on a real star, your star's parameters will be scientifically accurate. Just be sure to only change the star's name and location. Don't be tweaking any of its other parameters or you could undermine its realism. The difficulty with this method is in finding the type of star you want to clone. But if you put enough time into searching the internet for the type of star you want, you can usually find a suitable match. However, if your fiction requires you to have several custom stars, say to fill out a galactic empire, then this method may be more trouble than it's worth. If you're not going to use a nearby star or clone an existing star, then you'll need to build one. The first step in creating our main sequence star is choosing its spectral type. In my previous video, I explained how main sequence stars are divided into seven subcategories called spectral types, labeled O, B, A, F, G, K, and M in descending order of temperature. And if you followed along with that video, then you already have an idea of which of these spectral types you want for your planetary system. But each of these spectral types is further divided into 10 subtypes, labeled 0 through 9 in descending order of temperature. I know this doesn't make any sense. You would think that the higher the number, the higher the temperature, but alas, that's too logical for astronomers. So it's the opposite. The lower the number, the higher the temperature. For example, an M1 star is hotter and more luminous than an M5 star. 
Which one of these 10 spectral subtypes you choose for your star is entirely up to you. It just depends on whether you want your star on the hot side of the spectral type or the cool side. Once you've chosen your star spectral type letter and subtype number, we can add them to our sap sheet. I'm going to make my star a spectral type G8 Yellow Dwarf. If your star is going to remain a main sequence star or is going to be an early stage star, then you can place an uppercase V, or more accurately the Roman numeral 5, after the spectral type. This is the star's spectral class, and a Roman 5 denotes it as a main sequence dwarf. If your star is instead going to be a late stage star, then leave this out for right now, as there will be a different Roman numeral needed, which I will cover in a future video. Now that we have the star's spectral type, we can define its mass and effective temperature. To do this, we will consult a table containing a list of spectral standard stars. Each entry on this list represents an actual measured star that astronomers use to calibrate their instruments for measuring the spectra of other stars. This list is very useful for our purposes as it gives us a realistic starting point for crafting our stars. I'll put the table up on the screen so that you can pause and read the values you need, but alternatively I have placed a link in the video description that will take you to a Google Doc with the same information if you'd rather review it that way. Now the thing to remember about this table is that the values listed are just a reference for that spectral type. There are no absolute values here. This means that your star can vary by a reasonable amount from this baseline. To see an example of what I mean, let's look at some real stars. The Alpha Centauri system is great for this, as it has three main sequence stars, all of a different spectral type. Alpha Centauri A is a spectral type G2 main sequence star, just like our Sun. So on the table, it has a standard mass of one solar mass and a temperature of 5,770 Kelvin. But if we look at its actual values, we find that while its temperature is within the standard range, its mass is a bit higher than what's quoted and more consistent with the mean given for a G0 star. Alpha Centauri B is a spectral type K1 main sequence star and so has a standard mass of 0.86 solar masses and a temperature of 5170 Kelvin. Once again, its temperature is close to the standard value, but its mass of 0.91 solar masses is a bit higher and more consistent with the mean mass of a G9 star. Unlike its companions, Alpha Centauri C, which is a spectral type M5.5 main sequence star, has a mass and temperature that are both within the range given by the table. If I include the stars of the Zeta Reticuli system, which are both yellow dwarf stars similar to our Sun, we see that they are both a bit under the standard mass, but their temperatures are only slightly higher than the table lists. So the takeaway here is that you have a little bit of wiggle room around the values listed. The effective temperature of your star should stay fairly close to what's listed in the table, but its mass can vary by two or three rows up or down or you can use the values listed, it doesn't matter. I'm just saying that if you want to vary them by a little bit for the sake of customization, you can, just don't get carried away. For my star spectral type, its standard temperature is 5,480 Kelvin. So I'm going to set its effective temperature at 5,492 Kelvin. Its standard mass is 0.92 solar masses, so I'm going to set my star's mass a bit lower than this at 0.9064 solar masses. Before we move on, let's be all scientific and convert these solar masses into kilograms. To do this, we just take our star's mass in solar masses and multiply it by the mass of the sun. So for my star, I say 0.9064 times open parentheses. This calculation will work without the parentheses, but it's always a good practice to encapsulate a large scientific number in parentheses so that they can't mess up the order of operation. Now we enter the sun's mass, which is 1.9884099 times 10 raised to the power of 30. We raise a number to a power using this button here with the X and superscript Y. Remember this button as we'll be using it a lot over the course of this entire series. So now we close our parentheses and our calculation should look like this. The mass of our star times 1.9884099 times 10 to the power of 30. We press equals and there's our star's mass in kilograms. Next, we are going to calculate our star's luminosity. Luminosity is a measure of how much energy a star emits per second. So this is an extremely important parameter for the planets that orbit it. Now the usual method of calculating a star's luminosity requires knowing the star's effective temperature and its size. 
but we don't yet know the size of our star, so we'll have to use a different method. Fortunately, main sequence stars follow a mass luminosity relationship, as illustrated by this graph. Here we have luminosity along the vertical axis and mass along the horizontal axis, with the blue dots being measured stars and the orange dot near the center representing our sun. To have our star follow this same relationship, we can use this equation. Before we begin our calculation, there are a few things to mention about this equation. First, the value that we get out of the equation for our star's luminosity will not be in SI units, but rather in comparative units, that is, solar luminosity, or multiples of the sun's luminosity. Likewise, the mass that we put into our calculation will be in solar masses rather than kilograms. I point this out because it is unusual and will not be the case for the majority of equations that we will be using. Secondly, the y and a terms seen here in the equation are just variables that change depending on what mass range our star falls into. For stars with a mass of less than 0.43 solar masses, y will have a value of 0.23 and a will have a value of 2.3. Be careful with these values, they look similar so they're easy to get confused. Be sure to double check yourself. For stars with a mass greater than 0.43 solar masses, but less than 2 solar masses, Y will have a value of 1 and A will have a value of 4. And for stars between 2 and 55 solar masses, Y will be 1.4 and A will be 3.5. My star has a mass that is greater than 0.43 and less than 2 solar masses, so I enter my calculation as 1.0 times the mass of my star in solar masses, so that's 0.9064, and then raise it to the power of 4. Pressing equals, I get a value of 0.6749 for my star's luminosity. Now, looking at the graph, you may notice that while a lot of stars fall along the line plotted by the equation we just used, some lie a bit above or below the line. So you may be thinking that, like with the star's mass and temperature, you have a bit of wiggle room in this value. And you do, but you should be very careful with it. Stars deviate from this line for a number of important reasons, such as their age, their metallicity, even being in a binary system may alter this relationship. And there may be several other reasons that I'm not fully aware of. So, the safest action is just to use the value you calculated. But if you really want to customize this value, I wouldn't alter it any more than 5% up or down. As an example, I'm going to tweak my luminosity value slightly, making it 0.6755 solar luminosity. Once you have your star's luminosity set and written down on your SAP sheet, let's convert it to SI units by multiplying it by the sun's luminosity of 3.828 times 10 to the power of 26 watts. Your equation should look something like this. This gives me a value of 2.5858 times 10 to the 26 watts. Excellent. If you've made it this far, congratulations. You now have the critical foundation of a realistic star. If that's all you need for your project, then you can stop here. You don't have to have any more information. However, there is still quite a bit more that we could discover about our star. And if that interests you, then I hope you will join me in part two of this video where I will cover the numerous important and optional parameters for your star.